Welcome to the Heart of the Soul podcast. My name is Amana. I am a wild earth mama living in the Pacific Northwest, and I am your host. Um, Today, I'm going to be talking about death and my experiences of death thus far in my life. Um, Some of my personal stories and sort of Cliff Notes versions that I'll do full length stories of um, at another time. I just launched this podcast earlier this month on the new moon, and now we are hmm, six days away from the full moon, so now we're sort of in the middle middle section here as the moon is waxing, and my the podcast that you guys are listening to the most is the one about remembering the Bjorn and the story of the first death that I witnessed, which was his death, so that has inspired me to do this episode Um, speaking sort of about death generally, and um, I'm not exactly sure what's going to come out. I'm just winging it here. Uh, Before we get started, I'm going to choose a word here. I have Diane Sherman's little word card deck. Let go. Ooh, what a potent card for an episode about death. Because death is about letting go in so many ways. Um, Like I've shared before, I have experienced multiple deaths in my own life. I was present for the death of my first love when he was 26 and I was 25. I'm 38 now at the time of this recording. Uh, I also experienced the death of my first two babies, one an early birth and one, she was born almost at 37 weeks and she died in my arms moments after being born. We did know that she was going to die before she was born, but it was still very heavy and potent and life-changing. She has changed our lives forever. I, after she was born, I started work uh, in palliative care where I was part of the death and dying in a hospital and cared for many, many people as they approached this transition, this last transition in life, letting go into death. I saw a huge spectrum from babies to people in their 90s. And even actually before that job, I worked at another hospital where I worked on a floor that had the what they called end of life patients. And I had a couple of amazing nurses, Kim and Julie, who shared so compassionately and kindly with me, taught me the ways of caring kindly for people as they are approaching death. And so today, you know, I would welcome any questions you have about death. I'm going to speak a little bit about um, what I know about death from the context that I've experienced in my life. And then welcome more questions from you all to ask what you're wondering about death that I haven't spoken to. Um, Sometimes death comes really quickly from a trauma or some big event that brings death within hours or a couple of days. But I would say this is a more uncommon way of dying. Excuse me. Um, most, for most of the deaths that I have walked alongside people or witnessed their last breaths, it was often after at least days, if not like weeks of knowing or months of knowing that death was approaching. And then people, um, often as they're approaching this phase, 
depending on what is going on with their body. Oftentimes, you know, whether it's cancer or a stroke, um, an internal bleed, something that is no longer working inside of their body. That brings them to a state as they approach death where they become less and less vital. And this is sort of a word that has come up for me and I've had an awareness over a person's vitality and how when you meet people, sometimes you're like, wow, like they have this energy and other people you meet, or maybe you just see them. Like I was in a doctor's office a few weeks ago and I saw this young man and I could see that their life force, their vitality was low in that moment. And although sometimes these can be dips and people can recover in some ways and have more energy again. For some people, it's the sort of like slow up and down, like a roller coaster where they're down and then they're doing a little bit better, but then they go back down again, often never quite reaching the height that they were at prior. So slowly going down, having less energy, being able to do, um, less activity. So becoming more sedentary, sitting, lying, sleeping more. As death comes even more near, it is um, physiologically, biologically normal for people to start eating less because their body is starting to shut down. Those digestive organs aren't working to their full potential. And most of the person's energy is going to their heart and to their lungs, because those are the two main things. We need our heart and our breath and our brain. So those three things, but our body are going to our blood and our energy, our life force energy are going to those things. And so people often start eating less and less and maybe only have sips of things. And this is also something that's very protective because as their digestion system is starting to shut down it um if we if we try to force them to eat or put a feeding tube down their mouth studies have shown that it actually creates more dis- often creates more discomfort because um their body doesn't have the capability to digest the food in the same way so they might be get nauseous or have pains get constipated um, even have what's called aspiration where they're, where they, um, vomit a little bit up and then it goes down into their lungs and they breathe it in. So they're breathing in whatever food. So when people are nearing this very end window of life, um, it can be kind to the person to offer them offer them sips and tastes of what they want and what they ask for, or you can offer things, but respecting their no, respecting when they say, no, I don't want to eat that. No, I don't want to open my mouth for that. Because that's something that's helping them to have comfort in their own body. And so I feel like that's a real gift that we can give them is to respect their no. And often a person will drift into a more sleepy and unconscious state, whether they are receiving medications that um, enrich or what's, enrich maybe isn't the right word, but um, I can't think of the word. But if they're even if they're not receiving sedating medications, most people fall into a more sleepy, sedate-like state as death approaches. So we can do things to help keep them comfortable and safe and turn them a little bit in bed to help prevent pressure sores. People will often, like I said, just be sleeping more and more to the point where maybe they're not waking up, but once or twice a day, if we move them or, um, if their pain gets too high, 
So in the hospital, we look for signs of pain in people that are mostly unconscious and sleeping. Uh, in caring for people, we look to see that people that aren't speaking, even if we were to wake them up, we don't really want to wake them up if, um, if we don't have to. So we look for people to be grimacing like this, furrowing their brow, you know, mm, sort of uh, making signs, facial signs of pain. If a person is fidgeting a lot, this is also a sign of pain. And maybe it's because their bladder is full. Maybe it's because they're in pain um, or they're just uncomfortable in the way that they're sitting and we can help them to find a more comfortable position. Or it's perhaps because, or perhaps we give them pain medication to help relieve some of that pain. Um, and as people get deeper and deeper into this state, their breathing will often become more shallow. For some, they have what's called a death rattle is the name that is spoken for this sound that people make near the end of their life. It's often people breathing with their mouth open and you can kind of hear the, that there's a little bit of fluid. It's normally like in their throat. Uh, people often want to like suction it out and it's kind of in this place that it would be hard to suction unless you are, um, unless the person were unconscious, were like um, medicated and it just wouldn't be a very comfortable thing to do. It's not just in their mouth, it's like in their throat. And so we often give them medications, often medications are given to help dry up the secretions. And for some people, this, this is helpful and for others, maybe not. Um, so a person's breathing also may have more pauses in between it. In Bjorn's story, I described how it was like a breath. <sighs> and it's more of these almost like shallow gasps of breath oftentimes. And eventually the natural process would be that at some point the breath would stop. Oftentimes the heart will be beating at that time, but within seconds to minutes of when a person's breath stops, their heart will then stop beating without the oxygen. And I have witnessed this many, many times, sometimes with other family members present. At times, it was just me with this person. And I always find it incredible how palpable the exit of spirit is or soul that the body shifts from the energy of having life force energy from having breath from this meat suit being alive with a soul being embodied and when the breath leaves and the heart stops beating that the body becomes this empty vessel and things will shift about the body fairly quickly. Um, a person's body, the color will change. You might also notice color changes before a person dies, and that can be a sign that death is near when their extremities are less vibrant and pink if they're turning purple and mottled. So I can... Yeah, speak to the feeling of their soul being gone. And sometimes I, I often feel their energy in the room, but it's not no longer encased in this person's being. And I like to, when I have witnessed these deaths, I always speak to the spirits and wish them well and um, acknowledge acknowledge them and the infinite life force that they are and how they are an infinite being.
I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I feel called to share in this moment about death and dying. So yes, the body, our, our meat suit, when our soul has left, no longer moves on its own, obviously, but still going to state that there's no longer the breath. If a person has a lot of fluid in their lungs, that might start coming out of their mouth, foaming or like a drool out the side of their mouth. Um, a person also starts, you know, goes cold because their body was once, once warm and their body cools off even more. And hours later, that same body becomes more rigid for a period of time before then it relaxes again. It's called rigor mortis. Um, so in the hospital, what often happens after a person dies is they, the medical care people there will take all the tubes and unnatural artificial things out of that person's body, whether it be oxygen on their face, an IV in their arm, a catheter, catheters are common at the end of life. They'll remove these different devices and clean and honor the body. And in other cultures around the world, they have rituals and ceremonies that are practiced. I would love to do a whole episode about this and how our practices here in the U.S. are um, I find them to be sort of sterile and cold, and I would love to see um, the caring for our dying and dead brought back into our homes. Um, I think it's over 80% of people, when asked in the U.S. about where they would like to die, they say at home surrounded by loved ones, and yet it's a very small portion of humans that actually die in this manner. Almost, I don't, I'm gonna have to, I'll put the stat in the show notes because I can't remember it right now, but I feel like it is 80% or more of people that die in hospitals or nursing homes or hospice homes, not in their own home being cared for the ones that love them. So, I hope that you found value in this share today. Um, please let me know if you have any other questions or things you might want me to talk about. I know that this is a sensitive subject. Um, if this was hard for you to hear, I just encourage you to, you know, take with it, take with you what um, feels right at this time and, you know, leave what you don't need. And be grateful for your live body right now and embrace the unique life that you're living. Be brave, be bold, be love, be you.